Well, beekeeping can be frustrating, and I know one of the most frustrating things for all of us is finding the queen. Today, I'm gonna to show you two things that you're gonna really put in your toolbox for a spring. Number one, I'm gonna show you how to capture, cut out, and harvest a queen cell. This spring, your colony is gonna produce a lot of queen cells, swarm cells, maybe 12 to 20. You wanna capture those. Take advantage of all those future queens. You can make splits with them. You can store them in nuke boxes. Why buy queens when your hive is just handing them out to you? Well, because you may not know how to harvest them. We're gonna show you how to do that. Secondly, I'm gonna show you how to mark a queen. Let's face it, man, that queen just blends in with the other girls. And it's hard to pick her out out of 40,000 other girls in the hive. So I'll show you how I pick her up, how I mark her. I'll even show you how to put her in a queen box, queen cage. That way, if you want to save her, take her somewhere, or even sell her, you'll have that skill to add to your toolbox of tools. And after we come back in from the hive, I'm going to have coffee time. Some of you really have been asking about that. So let's get to work. I'll meet you back here after our time in the hive for some coffee time. There we go. And since this uh, queen cell is pretty ripe, it doesn't matter if I put it in a horizontal position here. Or vertical, it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, so the way to do this, I take like a razor knife, a utility knife, um, and I want to try to cut it uh, without piercing through the cell itself. So you're going to have to kind of cut behind it like this and loosen it up from the back side. Now, sometimes the back side is open. Get these bees out of the way here. And so if it is, I'll deal with that later. There's a drone. Um, so I'm just gonna try to be a surgeon here with my razor blade. Cut as much from, from the back as deep as I can. These bees are just simply eating some of the honey, that nectar that's there. Okay, it looks like it's pretty freed up. I always like to cut the, the top last, especially since most of the time I'm used to working this out in a, in a bee yard. This makes it nice to be on my picnic table here. All right. Now let's see if it's um, open in the back. I'll show you what to do if it is. I'm still attached a little bit. You can see it's really delicate little work you have to do here. And you want to try to not open up the queen cell. That's what I'm attempting not to do. Maybe it's attached at the top. Don't push very hard on the queen cell. Alright, there we go. Oh, wonderful. So you can see it's a nice queen cell that we harvested. It's got honey dripping on the top of it. That's fine. And so the queen in there is really ready to emerge because you can see how, let me use this, see how that's kind of dark right here? Around the tip of the queen cup or the queen cell. That usually means that this queen is ready to emerge. Okay, so I went back to my mating nook and I actually grabbed a frame uh, and got rid of the queen that was inferior. And as you can see by the brood pattern here, uh, the queen wasn't even laying. This is some leftover brood. This could be some drone brood from laying workers. And this is a, just a little mating nook. So again, a student raised a queen that just wasn't the right age. They probably got a too old of a larva. And so they're in desperate need of a new queen. And so this would be a great time to replace that failing queen. Okay, so what I do with this queen cell is similar to you know the way I took it off of the other frame. I just want to attach it, and I want to attach it kind of up toward the top up here, and that will give the hive the idea that it's a, a new queen, a supersedure queen. <clears throat> so now you kind of become someone that's just like a a welder. You're just going to find a way. How do I attach this? And you can use the same tool that I use. Uh, earlier my uh, utility knife and if you just kind of want to push it uh, don't open it up but 
kind of just give it a gentle um, shove into the comb. Maybe at the top you can smash it against some of the other wax. So it got a good little bite and it doesn't take much. It's not going to fall off. And let's just watch for a minute as these bees now are uh, quickly identifying that this is going to be a queen in there. And they, they can tell by pheromones, by the shape, they all know what it is. And according to this hive being queenless and having a failing queen for so long, you can see instantly that they're pretty excited about this. <laughs> and like I said, it's probably only going to take a day or two uh, until this queen emerges. And we could actually, if we wanted to, uh, cut open the top, uh, the entrance, a little bit, see if she would walk out. But I think it'd be a little bit premature to do that. I don't want to do that just introducing her. But this would be, uh, this is an example of how you can cut out these queen cells uh, from a hive, especially one where they're getting ready to swarm, or even if they just swarmed uh, and haven't emerged yet, you can open those up and put them places in your hive and your other hives where you need to, to put them. So this would be a, uh, a good boost for this hive, this mating note, to have a queen, a queen uh, cell that they need really bad. Um, again, uh, you can do this work over the top of your hive if you want to, but it seems like when I pull a frame out and I bring it into the shade, it's easier for me to do this work, like I said last week. Also, my bees really stay calm. Uh, when you pull them off and bring them to a, a place like this. They seem to just really uh, enjoy the shade, I guess. <laughs> so this is kind of my go-to surgery room now where I like to go to and do my work on my hives. I'm going to put the frame down. See, it's got open brood on it, and that's where it's got eggs, and she's located right at the tip of my finger. See her? So in order to, to mark her, what I'm gonna do is try to get her in position so I can pick her up. Some bees are feeding her now. I like to have her at a certain angle so I can pick her up like right here. Now, once I pick her up, I'm gonna put my finger right here like I told you on my tips until I see her two back legs. One back leg is kind of high, there they are. Now I'm just gonna hold on to her two back legs. This little worker bee, we can just brush it away. I'm just gonna pick this worker up and it just wants to feed the queen, okay. I'm gonna find my marking pen now and I'm gonna show you how you mark her. I'm gonna show you in 60 seconds how to grab the queen, mark her, and put her in a queen cage. In three, two, one, let's go. Where is she? Okay, I got eyes on her already. She's right here. I got her picked up. I'm gonna grab her back two legs to hold her stationary while I mark her. I got my marking pen ready. I'm gonna put a little white dot on her. And just for kicks, I'm gonna throw her in a queen cage. My hands are sticky. There she goes in the cage. 60 seconds. Mark well, I always like to add a little bit of honey into my cup of coffee. So thanks for joining for coffee time today. Good to have you along with me. Hey, let's start off with a great quote that I read from Francis Bacon. The quote says, crafty men condemn studies. Simple men admire them and wise men use them. I think that's a great quote. A lot of good studies come out in beekeeping. Crafty men might just condemn them and say, that's a bunch of bull. And simple men may say, that's pretty cool, I admire that. But a wise man will use them. So a lot of studies about bees that uh, if we're wise, we will use those studies and implement some of the things the studies suggest we should be doing in our hives. Uh, by the way, I've got some colors here, some queen marking pins. Those of you that have made it this far in the video, which really isn't that far, uh, I'm going to give one of these away for next year. Let's see, next year will be yellow. So 
I'm going to give a yellow marking pen away to a winner. So stay tuned. I'll announce what you have to answer correctly in order to win a yellow marking pen. But this is how we uh, mark queens with these little marking pens. So that's how we keep track of how old the queen is and what year, you know. It, we, we put the spacing in there because let's say, for example, we mark her this year with the white dot. So let's say we mark her white in 2021, ending in the number one. That means that we won't really mark another queen white again until 2026. That's a long time to have a queen live. And so it's virtually impossible. That's why there's a big gap there. So we mark the queen white in 2021. And if we see a white dot uh, anytime after that, years after that, we know that she was a queen from 2021. That makes sense? <laughs> Well, back to my quote by Francis Bacon, you know, I want to focus on how wise men will take studies and use them. In beekeeping, there's a lot of information, and I'm going to apply this to life too, but there's a lot of studies that come out over and over again about bees, and some of those studies that come out really do impact our approach to beekeeping. And we read those and we go, aha. But even studies that come out aren't always followed by beekeepers because there are some beekeepers that just don't buy into science or they don't give it much credibility. I've heard beekeepers say, I'm not going to listen to some professor in some ivory tower somewhere. Tell me how to keep my bees. I've been doing it since 1962. <laughs> Before that professor was even born, I've been keeping bees. You know, and that's that could be valid. I mean, there can be times when uh, a beekeeper is doing a great job keeping bees. He's done, he or she has done it forever. They're good at what they do. And they really are going to be able to be a good beekeeper despite or in spite of new studies coming out even though new studies may show uh, that there can be better ways of keeping bees, there are some people that will do fine just keeping them the way they want to keep them. Now, other people who throw the studies away and say they're worthless may find that had they adopted these studies, that they would have done much better with keeping bees. We have to remain open-minded. And you know, in beekeeping, I don't know what it is about beekeeping, but I've noticed that in order to become a beekeeper, you almost have to immediately sign up to be a closed-minded person. <laughs> and that's not as bad as it used to be. There's a lot of people today getting started in beekeeping, and especially younger people too. And I don't know, there, but when I started, there was a lot of closed-minded attitudes about beekeeping and about life in general. Uh, you know, sometimes we live in a closed, tight environment. You might be in a group of people who are of the same opinion that you are, we kind of embrace people of our same opinions. And we get into a really small circle and we pass around the same information and we sort of encourage it. Hey, did you hear about this? Wasn't that dumb? Yeah, that was dumb. Yeah, he is stupid. And our little group just throws and judges and we kind of form a small opinion about the world around us. Think of it this way. Um, your house right now, your property, uh, you know it really well. I know this property really well. I mean, I can close my eyes and walk through it, walk outside, and probably not bump into a tree. I know it that well. But if you're only just on your feet, physically walking around your property, you sort of see it one way. But let's say you get a drone and you take the drone up to maybe 500 feet up in the air and take a look at your property, you'll be like, whoa, I didn't know that my property was on such a, a, a hilly area. Or I didn't know the golf course was so close to my property. Oh my gosh, I didn't know I was so cl close to that next town. I didn't know my property looked like that from up here. You see things because you back out of your closed little I know all the little nuances up close on foot, but you back up a little bit and look at things from a broader perspective and all at once you see more because you can take more in. In life, it's that way too. I have been guilty of being in small circles, in close groups uh, of people 
that see things one way and anybody else that has a different view, you can become pretty judgmental of the other people and pretty close-minded. And I, I've been there, I've done that. But once you back out or get away from that tiny little group or that small little uh, group you're in, and you have more of an open mind, like you're in the drone high up above, and you start seeing things uh, from a broader perspective, I'll tell you, to be honest with you, having an open mind is so freeing. You know, sometimes we can get really close-minded toward other people, and especially people who are different than us. And I don't see the value in that at all. Rather, if we can look at other people that are different than us as a time to experience variety, our uniqueness, it's kind of fun to meet somebody that's different than you are and ask them about, wow, why do you do that? And I'm excited to hear your ways of approaching this. So in beekeeping, it can, you can run into some very close-minded people. You know, I had to stop going to beekeeping clubs. <laughs> Let's talk about beekeeping clubs. Beekeeping clubs, are they worth it or worthless? <laughs> that would be a great one, wouldn't it? I'll, I'll, I may have to do that. <laughs> but my thoughts on beekeeping clubs, they are really great, I think, especially for new beginners to kind of gain a foothold on beekeeping. You can talk to people, interact to people. You know, 2020 just burned that up. It, it didn't work because bee clubs weren't meeting. I'm getting a little better now. Beekeeping clubs are only as good as the weakest person there. And what I mean by that, if you have somebody there who is very demonstrative, their personality dominates the meeting. Maybe they're the president. Maybe they're the outspoken one. And anytime somebody has a question, like a new beginner says, yeah, I'm wondering, uh, is it good to use a salic acid or formic pro? Which would be better? I have a question. Maybe that demonstrative person, especially if they're the weakest link, they may answer it and give a very uh, opinionated position on, you should never use that one. Always use this one. I used that one one year and all my hives died. And maybe another person that would say, yeah, me too. Then another person says, well, I didn't. I used that and all mine made it. So sort of like the most demonstrative or I guess uh, loudest personality can oftentimes win out and influence the entire group to go a certain way. And so if you have a club that's really just one person's opinion, well, that can be good or bad. It depends on that person's uh, a, a opinion and how scientifically they are basing those opinions. So sometimes a club can not be enjoyable. I've been to some clubs before, and I find this if you get into smaller groups and smaller communities. Sometimes you'll spend the whole club meeting of 12 people doing nothing but griping about the president, high gas prices, and, and so on. That's all the club does, and there may be a five-minute minute of the re reading of the minutes, any, any new news, you know, you don't really gain much. Now, on the other hand, I've been invited to speak at very large conferences or, or clubs. I've been invited to speak in St. Louis many times at the clubs in St. Louis or in Chicago, big cities. There, there are sometimes hundreds of people at these club meetings, and they are ran by very, very, what's a good word? Um, I'm just going to say very professional people. And so everyone knows their place. They have a way of, you know, they have available books that you can rent out. They just have a, 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 per, a president that keeps the meeting really going well and timely. And I don't know, it's just like some of the, some of the clubs, you have to be careful. There's nothing wrong with people having their opinions and being strong about their opinions. But at the same time, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, people ask me, what do you like better, a salic or formic? I pull back to the science. Um, I say, well, a salic doesn't kill mites below the caps. Uh, formic Pro does. There's some benefits. So I don't really have to take a position. I can just recite the benefits, the pros and the cons of each one and let, let them decide. I think that's good to do that. 
rather than immediately tell people what they need to do. Tell them which one works better in different temperatures. You know, maybe Apovar would be better if you're going to be temperature sensitive than Formic Pro. Things like that rather than taking an angry position about it. So a lot of studies that are coming out about bees, uh, I think we should listen and read up on them. I do that. Every study that comes out, I read up on it. I read a study last week. I thought about bringing it. Uh, I could have it in front of me, but uh, it was a study about farm chemicals, neonicotinoids and the other farm chemicals. And it, it exposed, purposely exposed colonies uh, to these different farm chemicals and then watch these colonies over a year or so and to see how they reacted to these chemicals. And it was really impressive because the result of the study was, and you may not like this, don't get mad at me, I'm just reporting the news here. But the study shows that these farm chemicals like uh, neonicotinoids had little to no long-term effect on honeybees. Now, I know that's, I know that's what we don't want to hear. We definitely want to blame something for our bees dying. <laughs> I get that. We definitely want to blame somebody. But that's a study that came out. It was well done. No, it wasn't done by the chemical company, but it, it is a legitimate study. You can read it. You can see how they did it, how their controlled hives worked and all that. So I guess I feel like that, that when studies come out like that, it makes, us, it makes me want to pull back from accusing uh, the farmer industry of killing our bees and say maybe I should be more... Uh, responsible to learn more and help control why my bees are dying and maybe it's something else and so I need to work harder at mic control and so on. It, it's a matter of opinion. Uh, it's just a good thing for us to fall back on studies to help us. Now you may not want to fall back a hundred percent on studies. I totally get that. Some studies can be done in, in certain environments that we may not be exposed to, so it may throw the results. I, I understand all of that. But we really do fall back on science, on things that really matter. If you have a heart problem and you need to have heart surgery, I guarantee you when the doctor says we need to do surgery on your heart to fix a valve or something like that, you're going to rely on science. You're going to rely on the surgeon's knowledge, scientific knowledge of what to repair, how to do it, anesthesiologist, you're relying on their scientific skills. We always rely on science when it really matters. But sometimes when it doesn't matter, we think we know more. Bee clubs can be really good. You go, you decide, but if you're a new beginner to beekeeping, you're gonna have to go into a, a bee club with a grain of salt. And you're gonna have to use your people skills to quickly read people and identify, oh, this person really knows what they're talking about. They have science behind it, or you know, they have um, a nice way of presenting what they believe in. I kind of like what they're saying. Be able to take everything with a grain of salt because there's gonna come a point where you as a beekeeper, you are gonna have to take what you hear, what you read, don't condemn it, don't just admire it, but like the quote says, use it, but first research it yourself and make sure it is a valid and good study. But bee clubs are great. I think they are a good place for people to interact and exchange a lot of uh, skills, knowledge, equipment, and all of that. I think, I think bee clubs are good. But use, use the grain of salt method when you go. <laughs> this might be tough for some of you. It was tough for me at first. But you're going to have to expand, open up your mind a little bit, and realize that not everyone can be like you. Not everyone can hold your exact views, and just because they don't does not make them a horrible person. It makes them a different person. If it made them a horrible person, then you would be a horrible person in their mind because you're different than they are. See, you're not a horrible person, neither are they. But if we could just kind of open up our mind, take the drone approach and get up above the colony 500 feet so you can see around a little bit more, 
maybe your world would kind of open up a little bit more and you could see things that, hmm, I, I've learned a lot from that person. You know, at first I was a little skeptic about their approach or I was a little bit concerned about, you know, their attitude. But now that I've embraced the open-mindedness of getting to know them and being open to what they had to say, I've learned a lot from them. A lot of people have taught me a lot of things. And that's because I was just listening. And I didn't think I had all the answers. And so by listening to them and learning from them, gosh, I've learned a lot. <laughs> all right. So keep your mind open and uh, enjoy your day by embracing everything around you with a broader, more open mind and enjoy life to the fullest. All right, it's time to give away the Yellow Queen marking pen for 2022. This is a two-part question. First person who answers it correctly will win it and we'll ship it out to you. So here's a two-part question. What year did I become a certified master beekeeper? That's the first part of the question. Second part of the question is, what city and state did I take my exams in? All right, got it? What year did I become a master beekeeper? And what city and state did I take my exam in? That information, you should know that, <laughs> okay? Good luck. Well, thanks for watching my video. I appreciate it, guys. Love you all so much, and thanks for leaving good comments below. I like the way that we interact in the comments. I'm not always able to answer every comment because I'm a pretty busy guy, but I try to do as best I can. I love answering your comments. I really do. Please subscribe. Still kind of rowing my way to 100,000, and if we can get a few more people in the boat to help me row, my arms will not be so tired. All you got to do is use your finger to subscribe subscribe, not your arms. Click on the button that says subscribe. Doesn't cost you a thing. And click on the bell. That way you'll be notified each time I produce a new video. Someone told me that they saw a little video of, I think it was a little kid, two-year-old or something. And every night before he goes to bed, I think it's parents or content creators, before he goes to bed at night, he always, <laughs> he always says, uh, be sure and subscribe and and give us a thumbs up. Good night. <laughs> so be sure and subscribe. Give me a thumbs up. I'll see you next time. I'm closed-minded. That's, that's the best coffee. Boom.